Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for another Artex Academy webinar. This is Advancing Your Hook Care Program with Carl Berge from CF Cows Network. Just for a little thing to start us off, you can ask your questions through the question and answer section at the bottom of your screen or through the chat feature as well. We're going to be answering questions at the end of the program. You can also um, raise your hand and if you have any questions, we'll deal with it towards the end. And we'll also have a poll asking you to tell us how we did. So if you can answer that at the end of the program, that would be great. So right now I'll turn it over to Carl. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to be asked by Artex Barn Solution to talk a little bit about Advance Your Hoof Care Program, Implement the No Tolerance Policy. Uh, one of the things is over the years, I've, uh, I've traveled uh, a lot of parts of the world, but, but just like my foundation is, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, uh, I'm a hoof trimmer. And, and so uh, I still trim cows. I was out trimming cows this morning at one of the dairies. We see it in the video because, because uh, it's, it's, we go there on a regular basis and, and, and do what, we're, what we talk about today. So one of the things is a lot of the things is comes from the science end of it. Some of it, some of it comes from experience. Some of it is things that we've done in the field and we can show why it works. Now, the other thing I, I have to say is it's such a honor to be following uh, Sue, Jeff, Nigel and Mario because they've done a lot of the work because they talked about cow comfort, cow cooling, heat abatement, all those type of things. And it, it, that plays a huge uh, effect in the lameness equation, especially when it comes to, to summer times. And, and the summer times it might be in the Northern Hemisphere, but also in the summer, Southern hem Hemisphere. So what we're gonna do today is the losses, we're gonna talk a little bit, just a little bit about the losses that's associated with lameness. Uh, data that came out of the UK and, and the US here, we're going to talk about the top three lesions, causes and prevention, a little bit about hoof bat management, just a little bit about the modern hoof training method. And, and because there's not enough time in, in the 45, 50 minutes that we have available. And then how do we set up the success? What are the top farms doing? So when we look at lameness around the world, we can see on this, on this slide, it goes anywhere from 8.3 New Zealand to 53 some percent in US and North, Northeastern United States. And, and uh, one of the things here is the average mean is about 25% is about lameness uh, for various reasons. And, and uh, that's what we wanna talk about today. In, in 2016, uh, 15 or 16, there was a study done um, some of the top farms in Wisconsin, 66 of the top farms with 90 pounds of 41 kilos of milk per cow per day and, and uh, 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 various uh, facilities with SAM tree stalls, deep bedded uh, manure solid tree stalls and some mattress farms. And on those, the average lameness was 13.2%. So that's, that's uh, that was quite astonishing for such a uh, for so many herds, and the, the herds ranged from, I think, uh, 120 cows all the way up to over 2,000 cows. So, so one of the things here, lameness is an issue, but we have a lot of things we can do today to overcome it. So when we look at uh, studies that were done on the on the losses, when we look at digital dermatitis, uh, you know. Zero to 57 kilos. One of the studies, uh, Arturo Gomez here in the United States, 340 kilos more milk in the first lactation for heifers that didn't have, two-year-olds that didn't have digital dermatitis. 20 days on, on the, on the uh, calving interval. So, so uh, 20 days longer, we, 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 uh, we found with digital dermatitis. And, and uh, 
Arturo Gomez had the same thing. When we look at the white line lesion, the white line lesion, the milk loss is quite a bit more, 370 kilos and 30 days calving interval. And those are studies that are a little older today, uh, 86. And then the sole ulcer, the sole ulcer as well. The sole ulcer is, is the most devastating disease, but the easiest disease to prevent today. Uh, one interesting thing here, when we look at increased culling with digital dermatitis, it's low. White line lesion, 354 less days in the herd. Sole ulcers, 457 days less in the herd. Sole ulcers is one of the most, the, the easiest uh, disease to prevent. And we're, that's what we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Persistent mobility score three cows, that's on a four scale, lose approximately a, a, a thousand liters of milk in 305 days. A number two cow loses 500 liters. Some other work that comes from uh, Wilshire and Bell in, in the UK, you can see here very similar things. Uh, the loss for the sole ulcer total with Everything figured in is 1,041 US dollars. White line, 833, and digital dermatitis, 122. So, so lameness is a costly disease. And one of the things is that on the farm, we don't see a lot of times those losses because they're, they're gradual losses. They're not from one day to the next. Yes, we have a, light, a, a cow that comes on, like a white line can come on from one day to the next but digital dermatitis is a matter of, of, of a period of time. Soul ulcers, again, take time to develop and, and gradually that, that loss is there. So where do cows get lame? Okay, a sole ulcer, this is a hind right foot or a right, right hind foot. And a sole ulcer is always right here. The white line is in this, in this region. Anything in the toe is a toe ulcer. And, and, and I call this like the line here that I'm showing you, anything in front of that is a toe triangle. Digital dermatitis is back in here, in, can be in between the claws or also in the front. And then foot rot is, is uh, infection of the soft tissue between, between the two claws. So why do cows get lame? Two common claw horn lesions, sole ulcers and white lines are the two common claw horn lesions that we see. And there's one infectious hoof lesion. It's digital dermatitis, uh, mortalaro, or, or hairy warts here in the United States. They account for 95% of all the lameness in most herds, 95%. And we can do something about this. And that's what we're gonna talk about now. So a sole ulcer, we can see here a mild sole ulcer, mild sole ulcer, a moderate sole ulcer, okay? And, and one of the things is, just so, so we understand, these are all diagnosed at early stages, maybe with a good prevention program. And you can see here, every one of them is blocked because, because the reason they're there is there, is there is damage, there is inflammation inside, the inflamed corium can no longer produce healthy horn, and that's how a sole ulcer develops. This is a white line. We have two mild white line lesions and more, one that's more severe. You can see here, all three of them are blocked. Blocks heal cows. Blocks make cows recover quicker. Okay, and then we have digital dermatitis. Digital dermatitis, this is an early acute lesion. This is a chronic lesion, what we would call of the M stage, this would be an M4, uh, one stage. So it's a, a, a chronic lesion reoccurring. And this is a chronic acute lesion. And, and the difference between this one and this one is just time. Uh, this might be, uh, this is very early, maybe anywhere from five to 12 days. This one could be four weeks, six weeks, eight, eight weeks old, because, because we can see that because of all the uh, uh, hyperkeratosis, all the, the inflammation below it or, or the extra tissue that's present. It's not flush with the skin anymore. So when we, when we look at, at, at 
I got uh, data here from a couple of different farms. We just, uh, we just did three lesions, solalsis white lines and digital dermatitis. And one of them is by days in milk. And what, one of the things I want you to notice is, sorry about that, that all the lesions occur at the time when we're trimming. Because very few lesions here in, in that up to 120 days, because the, the trimming here is from 120 to 140 days. And, and then uh, maybe a, a handful of them a little older. And then the other thing is here with the digital dermatitis, the reason digital dermatitis is so high is because there's five stages of digital dermatitis. All of them are recorded in the system. So more likely here in, in the first uh, 30 days that, that maybe was, I don't know, maybe one or two, you can see one, one white line, maybe one or two white line, it's, it's hard to say on that. And then here you can see it by date. So we can see that that's pretty, pretty evenly all the way through. Actually it went down, all the lesions went down a little bit uh, going into, into the summer this year. But then here we can see here a, a couple extra soul ulcers uh, once the September came along due to, to uh, summer heat stress. A different farm, very similar things, okay? This one here, we have a much tighter trimming schedule. This, this, everything is done here between uh, 120 and 140 days. And you can see very little problems in between on the trimming days and again, we see the extra digital dermatitis because when, when the, the dry cow, the, the mid lactation trim happens, the dry cow trim happens that we see those lesions. They're not necessarily, uh, they're nece my, most of those would be M4 lesions or so chronic lesions that are not, not a problem. And you can see here again with the by days in milk, uh, by, by season, how, how they come out. So it's good to have some data to make management decisions. We know, we know here, uh, we don't really have anything to worry about on this 800 cow there. You can see here very, very few lame cows, hardly, uh, you know, a couple of soul ulcers. Uh, or maybe, maybe it's four to five soul ulcers. So we're not concerned about that. So what happens here? Today we feel like that inflammation is the pre-loop for lameness. So inflammation is stands behind it. So what we have is we have certain risks, inflammation risks. Calving period is the greatest risk. First calving is even greater than second calving, third calving. So, so and, and we'll come back to that. Trauma from abnormal forces. So walking surfaces, lack of hoof trimming. So, so or no hoof trimming or incorrect hoof trimming, poor therapeutic trimming. So that, which means when we have lame cows, we don't do the right things to get them recovered. Uh, so maybe uh, we don't trim them out enough. Prolonged standing, forced standing of cows, that would have to do a lot of times with overcrowding or heat stress or time in the milking parlor. We'll see that in a little bit. And then delayed lameness treatments. The longer we wait with, uh, to treat lameness, the more the severe, more severe the damage is, the more invasive everything is, the longer it takes to, to recover. Foot rot, which, which we're not gonna talk about it today, is really the only disease that requires antibiotic therapy. All the rest of them, uh, all the rest of them, will, in, in some cases, digital dermatitis at the early stage. But, but all the rest of the, uh, rest of the lesions basically require applying a block. And then we can see here improper or no blocking of claw horn lesions. Still some, or the blocks fall off. A lot of times the blocks fall off pre prematurely. The other thing is with, with severe lameness, anti-inflammatories for better lameness recoveries. There's some good data out there that shows that it's really beneficial. It's the right thing to do from an animal well-being end of it. So. The key is probably, and we're gonna talk more about this, to, to, to diagnose them early, to find them early. And that's what I had today. I had two cows today that were probably uh, in probably the first 24 hours because there was barely any pus 
in that white line. There was just a little bit of separation and those cows will come around very quickly. And, and it's crucial for that, for all of us to find those lame cows early. So what, what happens when the cows stand? And when you see on the right hand side here, I'm using my thumb. And, and for me, that symbolizes a cow when she's standing. So as soon as I put pressure on the thumb, you can see what happens on the bottom. All the blood, the blood pools, or the blood can't reach the bottom of it. In my opinion, this is happens when cows are standing too long. I, I, and, and, and the research that we've seen over the last, oh, I would say 16 years. In 2004, there was a study done that showed when, when uh, laying down decreased from 11 hours down to 8.8 hours, lameness went up by quite a lot. It's one of the best studies that was done. Because what happens is when we don't have good circulation to those feet, when the cow is laying down or she's walking, we're circulating that blood, we're pumping blood. But when the cow just stands because she's too hot, there's less circulation. So eventually that circulation increases the inflammation. It doesn't, or, or the circulation doesn't get rid of the inflammation that's there from, from the trauma of standing. So really important thing to understand. The other thing to understand is we have a crucial period which has the highest risk for inflammation. That's that 21 days before calving to 20 days after calving. This is the time where I want the animal, every dairy cow, every dairy heifer has to stand on perfectly trimmed claws up on their toes and, and, and modeled out, step three done. Well, we're gonna show that later on. The other thing is in this critical period, crucial period, I don't want to trim, I don't want to put the cows in the trimming shoot. It's either going to happen before 21 days or after 21 days. If they're lame, we have to do it. But we should not do trimming during that period of time because, because the, the, the risk of inflammation from the enzymes, from the hormones, they're, they're responsible for the birthing process and, and, and some of the other changes that happen happening during that period. So whatever it is, trimming only lame cows, but the, the goal is to prevent so there is no lame cows in this period. And that's with the farms I work with today around the world, that's our goal. And, and as soon as we achieve that goal, we, 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 lower that lameness, we lower that lameness equation. So exactly for this, this heifer here, 50 days, 55 days fresh, I, she sent, they sent her a trimming shoot to me. She was never trimmed before. She had a case of pneumonia three days before she calved. And you can see here, redness means she had inflammation. Part of it, probably the inflammation is there because she wasn't trimmed prior to calving. Because we would have, when we would have trimmed her, we would have trimmed this, what we called modeled this area out, taking the pressure off of there quite then. Okay, so we know today that when we see the hemorrhaging, there is already damage done to the fat pad underneath it or the digital cushion. And there is also damage done to, to the corium and the pedal bone underneath it. So the, the bone structure. And, and a lot of times this is irreverse, irreversible. And that's why it's so crucial that in my opinion, heifers, if we just would do the, the modeling before calving, Okay, when I do the modeling before calving, I never see any bruising because what we're doing is we're loading the claw according to what the anatomy designed it for. And you, what you can see here, if it prolongs, we get the sole ulcers like we got on both of, both of these. Okay, so standing cows. These are farms I've visited over the years. And one of the biggest problems there was is sole ulcers. Part of it probably was maybe incorrect, uh, some incorrect hoof trimming or not enough modeling. But, but a big reason for that was, was, uh, was sole ulcers. And you can see here, these are fresh cows, as an example. This, this is just, and both of these farms had problems with, with cow comfort. The, the freestalls were not designed for the cows uh, 
perfectly for the cows, so they would like them. They were they had obstructions or they weren't cushy enough or whatever whatever it was, and and that's 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 why the soil ulcer was there. Then we look at this this particular farm here, uh, a large farm. This farm on seven and a half thousand cows last year had less than fifty soil ulcers, and most of the soil ulcers were in fifth lactation cows and over. So good cow comfort, you can see here the fans, cooling, all of that. So, so less soil ulcers and good hoof trimming. This, this is a, a trimmer on, on the farm here that does phenomenal work for the last 10, 15 years already. So milking times play a factor and this from gate open to gate closed. And years ago, we used to say three hours of milking is okay. What's happening is our pen size has gotten larger. So we're, we're piling more cows in those holding pens, okay? And, and they're standing sometimes longer because, the, because we're overcrowding. So the parlor maybe was sized for, for maybe 200, 250 cows or 220 cows, perfectly to be done in 35, 40 minutes of milking. And all of a sudden we're, we're overcrowding 20% or, or something else happens. And, and, and we're not getting those cows through. So they're standing extra. And this is incredible crucial when, it, when it's summertime. Even though we have these fans up here, how are we gonna get the, the air down to the bellies of the cows? Uh, or even the heads, because most of the heads are down unless we crowd them too much. So for me today, one of the things is, is if I'm three times a day, I don't wanna, what I see is if we're over two and a half hours a day from gate open to gate close, I see an increase in soil ulcers, increase in, in lameness or thin soles. And on the farms at four hours a day, at four times a day milking, two hours is, is my opinion is, is the maximum because we disturb them that much more. The other thing here is very interesting. This is some work done in UC 2013 and there's more work coming on top of this. So the blue line is core body temp. And what happens is, is when that core body temp goes up to 39 degrees Celsius or 102 Fahrenheit, the cow automatically stands up if she's laying in the, in the stall. Because her body tells her, I'm too darn hot, I need to get up. The thing is, she won't lay down until her, until her body temperature is down to 37.8 or 100, 100 degree Fahrenheit. So, so, so the thing here is, and this keeps this happening, this, this keeps happening. So to understand is that the higher producing those cows are, the more heat they produce. And, and that's another reason the cows stand. And that's another reason why our text has done such a, a good job uh, uh, of, of promoting cow cooling, cow comfort, and all those type of things with, with all the experts in the world. So, so heat stress in the holding pen. I put this together because when you guys look at a resting human produces about uh, 200 BTUs per hour. So B, uh, British terminal units, okay? 500 humans produce about 100,000 BTUs, okay? A hair dryer on low, medium, on high, on low produces 2,500, on high it produces 6,000. A cow producing 45 plus liters of milk, we know today produces about 6,000 BTUs per hour. And what I want everybody to understand is when you put them in the holding pen, this is how much high producing cows produce in the holding pen. So that would be like going in the holding pen and turning on uh, 100, 100 hair dryers on high. And, and everybody can relate to that because, because uh, uh, hair dryers, what they do is when, when, it, when we're in a, in a bathroom or something like that and we're in the hair dryer for a while, all of a sudden that bathroom gets really, really hot. So, so just that heat stress, 500 cows at, at 45 liters produce 3 million uh, BTUs per hour. And, and we know what we saw before that those cows will not lay down. So, so What's really important is when it comes to controlling soul, soul ulcers, the control factors, modern hoof trimming. So first lactation heifers and dry cows, I want them trimmed three to eight weeks before calving, just to check up 
mainly on the back feet is the most important, the back outside claws. But if we can stand them up a little bit, up on their toes, and, 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 and do the, the, the modeling, we, we're going to have, we're going to prevent soil ulcers. Uh, today, a lot of the farms, uh, good farms, they don't see soil ulcers in the first lactation, second lactation, and, and as cows are older, they, they kind of uh, show up a little bit. The other thing is we need to do this to those cows anywhere from two to four times per year, depending on environment management. So if we have rubber floors, we probably have to do it four times a year. If we have sand beds twice a year, a checkup uh, or one and a half times a year sometimes is, is good. Or uh, some of the farms, we do the back feet mid lactation and we do the front feet in a, a, a dry off. So we do the back feet twice and we want to use that larger model like we, sh we show a little bit later. And, and, th and the, the ideal would be is that we get those cows to lay down 11 to 12 hours because, because maybe they won't lay down 14 hours. But if we get them down to lay down 11 to 12 hours a day with, on a, in a cool place, we're going we're gonna to reduce soil ulcers. So here is, 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 is a, a, a nice barn here. And, and uh, at this particular farm with, with uh, 800 cows milking in the last year, we had five cows or eight cows with soil ulcers. You can see here, we're gonna see more about this. This was a, a kind of a, a pet project. Uh, we've got the, the perfect floors. We've got sand free stalls. We've got cross ventilation and, and, and uh, and, and so uh, very, uh, the barn doesn't freeze in the cold of the winter. And, and we haven't had to use, we haven't used sprinklers in the summertime to keep cows cool because the air movement uh, has done a great job. And this, this farm is doing around uh, uh, 93 pounds, so uh, 42, 43 liters uh, per cow per day. So quite amazing, uh, quite amazing. So. When it comes to white line lesions, again, we saw them before. White line lesion causes slippery floors, poor walking surfaces. So, so what we see here on the right, you know, I still see floors around. I see un improper grooving like this around, and then we have the long toes, stockmanship, and again, hoof trimming. Hoof trimming plays such a huge role when we. When we set those cows back on their heels, they're going to be anatomically more, much more susceptible to, to white line lesions. And, and here is, is, is a nice video. I see this too many times. We were called to this farm because they had a really a lot of problems with, with white line lesions. And when you watch this crowd gate go, and, 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 and you watch this black cow right here, what's happening to her? Okay, she's gonna get squished. She's gonna get squished. Now she's slipping out. Look at here how she's slipping out. And, and, and that's where the white line lesions come from. Way too aggressive for use. So this is part of stockmanship. And, and every time we think that if we move those cows up, the cows come in better in the front. But what's happening is when we crowd them too close together in the front, the lead cow doesn't have access to enter the milking parlor. So it's actually uh, a disadvantage to crowd them this close, this close. And the other thing is we make them hotter. We heat those cows up because now no air can go in, in between those cows because they're so tight. So crowd gate should be to index the space, but not to, not to push the cows. And what's happening is that sideways slamming that we saw, that puts, puts inflammation trauma into the side. And eventually what's happening is that trauma leaves an opening for bacteria to go in there and then it causes a bacterial infection. And you can see here, every one of these two, this one, they, they get a block as well. But, but that's what, uh, that's, again, the recovery is just proper therapeutic trimming, removing the loose horn, thinning out the margins, and those cows will heal very quickly. In a matter of 10 days, two weeks, there is no more corium showing. And, and although it takes some time for this wall to 
uh, grow down and, and, and strengthen up. So it might be two, three months before, before that's happening completely. So blocks should stay on anywhere. I like to see them on five to seven weeks. And sometimes at five weeks, I just reduce them like 80% with, with a trimming wheel and leave that extra, leave that, leave that extra uh, wood and, and, and adhesive on there. So white line leaves and control factors, proper stockmanship. So teaching our guys how to run the, or, or setting the crowd gate correctly. Also moving the cows to the parlor or walking through the pen. When you walk through a pen of cows and everybody takes off, that's a sign of poor stockmanship on the farm. Then we wanna have concrete floors with appropriate grooving for good traction. And we'll come back to this. This picture actually shows when we have the proper grooving which we call the deep groove, and I come up with the dimensions later. One of the claws or both of the claws are always resting on the groove. And you can see a video later how the cow's mobility is when we have the right grooves, okay? Hoof trimming, again, you know, to, to try to, to prevent, try to, to fix that anatomy so that so the cow is up on her toes, she's balanced out, and we model out that, that outside claw improving that claw angle. Sand bedding is the ultimate. As soon as we have sand bedding, even on a slippery floor, it, it, sand is like grit, it gives better traction and, and less for cows to, to slip out. So here we can see on, on this video here, okay, these cows going, coming, coming to the parlor. This, this is normal. This is normal for these cows. Uh, two to three times a day, they run, run to the parlor. They would not run to the parlor if the floor wouldn't sec be secure. And what we did here at this particular day, we poured all the floors and then we cut the grooves afterwards with, with uh, diamond saw blades. And we went to this dimensions, 1.9 centimeters wide, 1.2 centimeters deep, and 8.3 centimeters from center to center or about uh, 6.5 centimeters of flat area in between. And, and you can see here how those cows run. And the interesting thing is from the running at this particular dairy, what we, what we see is we see some lesions because the cows are running. The other thing is we see the cows, uh, I was there at this dairy shortly, not that long ago, when those cows are on heat because the floors are so secure there's not never a cow that they can't see in heat. And they, they actually show much better heat because the floors are secure. But the thing has happened is that sometimes we get an injury here or there because cows are just so crazy when they're in heat. So, so they're, they show very, very strong heats. All of this information on the grooving is also uh, was, was uh, conducted or, or collaborated with the Dairyland Initiative of the University of Wisconsin. And 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 I, I think I think we got we got this right because it, it's it's really working on the farms where we we got those nice sharp edges on the grooves that really catches them that catch those hoofs nicely from slipping up. Next thing we're going to talk about is digital dermatitis, and and digital dermatitis is a disease. It's it's a, a more a freestyle disease. Okay, and again, I show the same pictures, the early acute lesion, the chronic lesion, and the chronic acute lesion. And, and, and the point to make here is, the, this shows quite nicely what's actually happening. This is a cow with an early acute lesion. And that's usually what they do is they just dance a little bit with that hind foot. They just dance a little bit. Okay, just hold it up, standing by the water trough. The key with this disease is to get it at a very early stage. Now, this is a heifer that's probably not fresh very long. Maybe she had it before calving, but now so some other things to understand with this disease is, this disease is highly influenced by, by hygiene, okay? The dirtier the hoofs are, and I've, I've been in the hoof trimming business for, for 30 some years now, and, and I, can, I can tell for certain that wherever we started a freestyle barn at the beginning, twice a day scraping, some, some of them just once a day scraping, that's when digital dermatitis started. 
and you can see it, you can see it at this particular dairy here. Okay, these cows, this farm had 65% of the cows with digital dermatitis when I when I visited this dairy, and you can see here lameness because they had digital dermatitis, and now she's just gonna. Uh, soak her feet again instead of the hoof pass, she's going to see soak them in a in a pile of manure, just like the the last one. And and the thing to understand here is there is there's no no free system in a long barn with an with an alley scraper. There's still a lot of manure in front of those. But the thing we've learned about this disease is this: the primary cause is a breakdown in the immune system. So breakdown in the immune system is mainly happening at calving time, okay, because of the, of the stress of everything. And the other thing we know is that there's a, there's a period when the heifers first come in the heat. So when the heifers first show estrus, somewhere around 10 to 13 months, they're at much higher risk of contracting digital dermatitis. The other thing is, in those cases, if we have compromised skin integrity, which we just saw on, on the last slide with, with, with 30 feet, this is compromised skin integrity, okay? Uh, opportunity, what it does is it gives bacteria an opportunity to enter. The other thing is the bacteria require a little oxygen environment. So the manure, the more manure build up there is on the hoofs, the better it is for the bacteria because, because they can actually find their likable environment to succeed or to multiply. And to understand is that in the laboratory uh, at the University of Wisconsin, we tried placing bacteria that caused digital dermatitis on healthy skin and nothing happened. We had to get the skin weakened by soaking them in soaking them in water and put them in a boot for, for, for six days, five to six days. And then we could get digital dermatitis to do uh, reproduce on unhealthy, unhealthy animals. So hygiene plays a huge big factor. Here we've got heifers, breeding aged heifers. Okay, this is already a lesion like this. And the thing we know today is when we identify this lesion early and treat it early with a topical antibiotic, some parts of the world we have an aerosol spray, some parts of the world they, they, there is a, a tetracycline uh, liquid or a tetracycline powder that's used. If we use two grams of tetracycline 324 for a lesion like that with a, with a, with, with a light bandage for 24 hours, 24 hours, we're gonna have a very high success rate with these at the early stage. But you can see here, both of these lesions are, still have the hair left in on the lesion, and which means they might only be five to seven days old, okay? And we know if we catch them before they go to the proliferated stage, to the chronic stage, it's quite successful to treat them. So we have to observe the heifers and treat them early as well. And you can see here at this particular farm, we, here we had uh, 1200, uh, 600 heifers. And we went down and we found, we did DD check in the heifer pen. I think we found 10 heifers. A uh, couple of them were already chronic, but a couple of them, this, this was an early, this was an early lesion. It doesn't show very good. So, so and, and here we have two chronic ones, probably had them before, but otherwise they were pretty clean. So making sure that, we treat those lesions early because it shows that if a heifer doesn't have a lesion or if we treat them early, more than likely they do not reoccur. But if we treat them too late, they reoccur. And heifers that had more than two lesions as, as, uh, in, before they calved had almost a 70% likelihood that they had lesions again in the first lactation. But I can see today is when we put DD check programs into the heifer barns and the heifers come in without DD, we don't have a problem in the, in, in the first lactation. We don't have a problem in the second lactation. It's all over the world from, from the US to Germany, to Switzerland, to Russia, to Japan. We practice those type of things and, and it works. We have to go after the heifers. 
We have to get those M2s, those early M2s, okay? Because what happens is, is if we treat them too late, like we saw that, that chronic one before, we can get results with those. But again, too, the bacteria are insisted in there. They migrated deep in, into, into the epidermis. And that's why we have hyperkeratosis with extra tissue present. These will always come back again. And, and, and we can't really do a whole lot. These will spread when they, they reoccur. So I'm gonna go back to this one here. This first one. We found that these weren't spreading, but these, when they start reoccurring, these chronic ones, these are the spreaders on the farm. These are the spreaders on the heifer farm. If you treat them early, there's a much reduced likelihood that they'll spread because at this, in the laboratory at this stage, we could not reproduce them. We could reproduce from them, plenty of them. So going forward here is, is new infections can only be prevented with a regular hoof pad and good hygiene, okay? So the integrated approach to control the dermatitis is early observation in heifers starting at 10 months of age. Excellent hygiene, aggressive early antibiotic treatment for the first lesion. And I'm saying the first lesion. If that lesion comes back, we can use anything else that's, that's, that, that's used for, digital, that's recommended for digital dermatitis lesion. But I, I found uh, some of the work that was done the best results with non-reoccurrence afterwards was with a topical antibiotic. And then we use, need to use a well-managed consistent hoof bath to control those chronic ones. So to control these from, from, from reinfecting again. And, and again, good hygiene is an important factor, okay? So we control the M4 lesions and the, and, and the chronic lesions and the early a hoof pass will control the very early lesions that sometimes we don't even see because they're in between the heel bulbs. So here is a way to improve hygiene on a rotary parlor. This farm had a, had a fair amount of uh, digital dermatitis. As you can see, when we get to the feed here, all the chronic stage, but the feed get washed off three times a day. We had very few active lesions because the other thing is with the clean feet, if you run them to hoof bath, the hoof bath is much more effective. You can see here how nicely it cleans his feet off. And again, most of these cows had M4 stages, okay? But just with the good hygiene would, would reduce, reduce it. And, and it doesn't, here we saw two sprayers. One of them is probably enough. It just has to be at the right angle and, and it could even be up a little bit more and just hitting those back heels because 95, 98% of the digital dermatitis is gonna be in the back feet anyway. When it comes to hoof bath, this is what we today, we know that works. We, there was various work done with the University of Wisconsin here. We tried to look at length of the hoof baths, depth of the solution and all of that. And we came up uh, with the solution that if we have a four meter long bath, so a, a 10 foot long, 12 foot long bath, and, and about 50 centimeters wide, 22, 20 inches wide, uh, nice high sides. And, and what we wanna have the high sides for is so the cows can step out, step the hoof baths. And the other thing is it keeps the solution in there. We like to see a, a 10 inch or a 25 centimeter curb on, on the end and only about four centimeters, uh, uh, 10 centimeters of solution. This holds about 180 to 200 liters of water, and, and, and which is which effective. The other thing we find, and we see it in the videos, we like to put higher walls on it on top, and, and it's part of to build a race for the cows, because what we find is when we have a race, they don't defecate so much. Common solutions that are used is a 2.5% solution of copper sulfate with uh, about 100 grams or a half a gram per liter of sodium bisulfate. And, and the most important thing is, depending on the pH of the water, some places it might take less, but our goal is to monitor that pH. We don't wanna have a pH that's below three. 
never below three. And we know after it goes to over five, five and a half, the solution is not effective anymore. When you mix those type of things, it helps if we mix it with also with a little bit hot water, but what sodium bisulfate helps, it helps us get that copper into better solution. So it'll be a dark blue solution. You can see here, I've got hoof sink on there in the US. That's a, that's a product that's, that's a commercial product that's available. It's a sink, product, sink chloride product. Seen some pretty good results or pretty good control with that. And, and we can use some of that in rotation as well. There is products to use in rotation. People that use formalin, it's important to understand is that the stronger we use it, the more we burn the lesion. The weaker we use it, the more it works as a disinfectant, especially if, if we have a four meter bath. I have multiple farms where we are less than 2% of formalin, so two to three liters per two, 200 liters of water, up to four liters at the maximum, okay? And, and, and we're, we're having superb results. There's not an issue on those farms with digital dermatitis. Because if we have active M2 lesions, chronic lesions with a stronger solution, we're actually burning the outside of the lesion, we're forcing the bacteria deeper inside. And the other thing is, if there is commercial products out there and, and you see success with them, integrate them into your program. But for me, only if they get, get results. I want to see some data first before I, before I put them in. And, and if, if I use them, uh, say, uh, three or four times a month or six times a month to reduce the copper usage or use the formal usage, and I'm getting good results, uh, I would use them. But, but I caution you to a lot of products out there that really are not giving satisfactory results. And here, this is what it looks like. This is a hoof bath. This farm used to have horrible problems. All of these, this one as well. And we put the sidewalls in there. And you can see here on both of these, what's happening is how these cows move through the bath, okay? No stopping, there's no stopping here. Uh, at this particular dairy right now, we're running, we're running well over 600 cows uh, 700 cows through the bath before we have to change the solution. The same thing at this smaller dairy, they, they had uh, 175 cows and there was no manure. This was at the end of the milking and you can see here, there's no manure in the alley because those cows never drop manure when they're in a race when they can't see out. And you can see here, nobody was chasing them. They, that's the last group out in the parlor. They just moved through it. And that's how we can extend the life of the solution. So we want to have a race that's about, about a cow's length in front of the bath and a cow's length behind the bath. And, and, and uh, that's how we get the great results. Each one of those farms I work with personally and each one has good results. So hoof trimming skills. Hoof trimming is high skilled work. And for the producer in the crowd, or, or, or one of the things here is with this picture, it's pretty easy to shave your head. It's a lot more difficult to put this on. This takes skill. Knowing what to leave on so it looks good. And for me, when, when the, as a producer, so many times the producer is paying for the hoof chips on the floor. What's taken off? He's impressed, oh, we had a lot of hoof chips today. And, and, and the thing here is, there's a lot more to it. For me, it's more important to know what to leave on, especially as the farms get larger. It's, it's so crucial. The measuring stick in the industry is still sometimes the number of cows trimmed in one day. What should we measure? Me, from, in my opinion, is hoof trimming preventing lameness or causing lameness? If I work with lame cows, lame cows take time. If, you, if I want them to recover, it takes time to apply a block and keep the block on for five to seven weeks. So are lame cows recovering following therapeutic trimming? Do cows become lame or, or stay lame? Low lameness, in my opinion, or what I'm seeing around the world uh, with my traveling, we have good hoof trimming. I've gotten in, gone into some herds with high lameness cases in a matter of three, four months, we, we went down 75%. For me, worldwide, 
80% of the claws are over, over incorrectly trimmed or over trimmed, like in this, this particular case. This was a hoof trimming demonstration, over trimmed, where, where we, there's not enough sole thickness here. This is gonna result in toe ulcers. You can see the walls were removed, okay? In, in 2017, uh, Dr. Nigel Cook said, if a farm has a lameness problem, you more than likely also have a hoof trimming problem. And I gotta completely agree with him. It's not how many times we trim the cows a, a year, or which cows we trim is how good we do when we do the job of the cows that need to be trimmed. And the farms with the, with the best, with the best uh, hoof health worldwide, detail management, good cow comfort, and excellent hoof trimming. So just a little bit about hoof trimming. More and more, uh, I've been in this uh, business over 30 years, but more and more I understand there's only one anatomy. The anatomy is the same if I'm in Russia, if I'm in UK, if I'm in South America. The, the anatomy of that claw is always the same. The lesions depend on the management or the environment. So for me, hoof trimming is strictly dictated by the anatomy because what we need to do is we need to make sure that the anatomy or the biomechanical functions are properly to what the claw was designed to do. And with, with today's environments, we have larger farms, maybe we have, or, or freestyle barns, under our cows, not enough wear, or we have too much wear, all of those things play, in, play into the equation. And this is what I was talking about, the larger model on the lateral claw. This is how we prevent sole ulcers. One of the, some of you guys might say, well, she might be lame underneath this here. The thing we have to understand that is, Better than 95% of the lameness is on the outside hind claw in the back. Better than 95%. If she is lame on this one, she's going to be three-legged. So in this case, taking this away may, might be, uh, might be a, a, a big negative because we're taking surface away, we're taking stability away. In modern hoof, tri hoof trimming, uh, the medial claw cares the responsibility. Years ago, we said it's the outside claw that has the responsibility. For me, the inside claw has the responsibility. The healthier, the stronger the medial claw is, the less lameness we see. So we can see here a couple of videos. So length, this is a grazing cow, a little extra long. And then we also start this one here. And you can see here, all of these are different, but, but the system, we're trying to stand those cows up on their toes, okay? So she's a, a grazing cow on the left over here. This is a confinement cow. The other thing is, is I cannot finish good functional hoof trimming without a sharp hoof knife. And, and it's the most crucial part, you know? When we do the hoof trimming, now we finish the job up. We don't, important here is that we, come, we don't come too far into the toe, that these margins are kind of thinned out for the prevention of limox or tilomas or corns. When we thin these margins out, this is what healthy feet look like. You can see here, we sand it up on the toes. This farm has a fair amount of wear, but this is what it should look like, a finished trim foot. So, so, and, and that's, that's, what, that's around the world. The farms that are doing this type of trimming have, have very little lameness. When it comes to grazing cow, well, we do a little bit less lameness because in grazing cows, we rarely see sole ulcers. As soon as the cows are forced to stand more, we feed them a TMR as a grazing cows, the sole ulcer rates go up. Then we have to do the modeling. So modeling is the sole ulcer. Step three is the sole ulcer prevention. So, Success in the details. For you guys, when you, when you get out to your dairies or, or, or uh, as the dairy uh, producers that are listening to, the goal is to have less than 2% soil ulcers on a farm, less than 4% white lines, 0% toe ulcers, four, less than 4% digital dermatitis, and that's a challenge, and less than 1% uh, foot rot. But the digital dermatitis, um, 
it's an achievable goal. It, it, it will take time if we have a high infection rate, but multiple farms I work with today, we went from uh, 30, 40% of the, of the cows uh, coming into the dairy with, or heifers with digital dermatitis today to probably three or 4%, you know? So the other thing here is on the right, it's just a way that we record claw horn lesions. Very simple. For, for anybody to understand. We have this in multiple languages as well. And, and we really, uh, we really wanna, uh, this is just the claw horn lesions. We wanna have simple data, uh, severity doesn't matter, action, the block doesn't matter because the action should always be the same. And, and, and this whole thing, the success is no lameness tolerance. So, of trimming schedule like we already talked before, eight to three weeks. Lameness is treated within 24 hours. We have to get into habits. I don't, I don't visit any farms where mastitis isn't treated on a daily basis. And for me, when we treat lameness on a daily basis, we do uh, functional trimming, modern functional trimming. Lameness is never severe because the, we catch the lesions early. There is not as much damage there, there is they, they come around much quicker they take less time to recover and we don't lose as much production on them and there is less damage done and and the, the lactation assessments depending on the on the housing environment management age of cow a lot of my older cows for fifth lactation they they come to the trimming shoot three times a year cows have had lameness issues for sure, are gonna, we're going to see them more often, uh, you know. I'm going to see them either any, every 8, 10, or 12 weeks, just depending, depending on the farm. And, and because when, when they're lame, I'm already 6 or 10 weeks too late. But if I can keep them going without becoming lame, that's the goal we have to have on the farm. And, and that's why some of these farms have 5 to 8-year-old cows and, and have high production. And, and uh, that's, that's what it takes. So prevent, uh, just like we said before, regular locomotion scoring of cows and herds with lameness. If I have a herd with very little lameness, it's more important to daily observe the cows that, that come lame. But a herd with lameness, it's very difficult to figure out which cows do need the attention today or, or this week, and then which cows we're gonna do next week. And that's why the locomotion scoring is, is important in those herds. In my low lameness herds, daily observation. The people, that, the stockmen that bring the cows to the milking parlor, they're responsible to, uh, do, to pick out those cows because they see them get out of the stalls. The cow that's coming lame today, she's gonna be slower or she's, walks, she's in the last group going to the parlor back end of the holding pen. And then we wanna have some records to analyze, simple records, like I said before, to make management decisions. Very important part. This particular farm went from 3,500 to over 6,000 cows and less than 5% lameness. We were at, at uh, last year at 77,000 cows. We, we had for a year with all the lesions, foot rot, leg injuries, everything it was 350, uh, 350 animals, less than 2% or 2.5%. So, and, and again, two here. We see cow comfort, right? Sand free stalls, ventilation, tunnel ventilation. We have cooling in, in the handling area. But the, the biggest thing here is no tolerance to lameness. These cows are looked after every, every day of the week. If there's a lame cow, she's going to the trimming chute up here and is going to have a block put on. So the no lameness tolerance, this is the secure floor. You can see how those cows move on this floor that we just saw before. So it's gotta be flat, cut grooves are better than, than uh, floated grooves, but, but just going back here, when you see on this herd, we never have to locomotion score. If they don't run, they're lame and, and, and and we saw the same video before. So it's, it's just having the good cow comfort. And, and when we have floors like that with sand, 
even with with uh, green bedding, they're they're quite secure. And and you can see here they're coming again here. They're just coming, and with that, animal well-being is everybody's bottom line because that's that's where where the money comes in. So prevention is the number one, and we need to start. With the, with the complete package. We need to have the right facility. We need to have the cow cooling. We need to make sure the management is on top of things, uh, giving the, the, the guys uh, time to identify the lame cows and treat the lame cows on a regular basis, prevent digital dermatitis in the heifers so they don't, we don't bring it into the milking herd, all of those type of things. So, so with that, I thank you everybody. And, and I think uh, Karen will probably come on and I certainly think there's probably some questions. Absolutely, there are. So I'm gonna start off with a gentleman, uh, or yeah, the engine. I'm probably yep. pronouncing that wrong, but please, you can unmute at any time and ask your question. You might have to unmute. Yeah. Engine, you have to unmute. Okay, but well, while we wait for that, I'll ask the next question. So with digital dermatitis, is it caused, oh. or is it because the pathogen is hidden in the manure? The, yeah, the pathogens, I just learned again here, and not that long ago, it's basically, we find those pathogens in the, in the manure, in the digestive tract, so they're all over. So if the skin condition is justified, they're there ready to, 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 to evade, you know, they've been found in manure samples, the bacteria, those, those spirochetes, and they, they've been finding, been found all over. So, so really, uh, we know there is some type of a genetic heritability a little bit that animals that uh, have digital dermatitis have, have a, a certain uh, genetic makeup. But, but one of the things when, when they look closer at it, that genetic makeup goes with high milk production. So if you don't want digital dermatitis, you're gonna have low milk production. And, and the thing I wanna say here is that we've been so successful in controlling this disease on a lot of farms all over the world that I don't think I wanna sacrifice milk production uh, unless, unless we find a genetic line that still has high milk production and has higher resistance to digital dermatitis because it's a disease that can be managed. Thank you. So uh, with the sprayer in the parlor, was it uh -huh. water that was in that? It's only water. It's only water to spray it off. It's because uh, remember hygiene, if, if we wash our hands on a regular basis, uh, you know, and, 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 and I, I don't think there's any point to put any disinfectant in that. Every place I've been is, is I don't think it, there, it would be an effective enough for the, for the active lesions. That the key to it is to make sure that when we see active lesions, we use proper treatment pr protocol to address those, individual treatments. And, and I want everybody to understand that it's not possible to treat lesions, active lesions, with cows going through hoof baths. It's not possible. So it's very important that we, we go after those lesions just like we talked about from the beginning, looking at the heifers, looking at the first lactation animals as soon as they calf. And then, and then, and then uh, uh, you know, go, go, go from there. So, Perfect. okay. Is there, is there a vaccine? Uh, there has, there, there, you know, there were some tried over the, over the years, but, but uh, um, never, never was any success. And, and because they think it's a, it's a skin disease. And I see here, uh, no, there's not a vaccine. Okay. What type of rubber mat you prefer and how size in the parlor and parlor passage? So, so good, good question. So for me, if I put rubber into a facility, okay, one of the most important thing is to have it on downhill slopes where cows make 90 degree corners and when cows walk long walking distances. The most important thing for the cow is a comfortable freestyle. 
you can have all the rubber in the barn. If she doesn't gonna lay in, in the free stall, you're, not gonna, you're gonna have lame cows. Because when she lays down, her feet dry out, she's not standing in the muck, causing more digital dermatitis, all those type of things. So, so, so uh, you know, on some of the farms today, we, we're removing the rubber that they put in years ago. We changed the hoof trimming, and what happens is lameness goes down. Okay, how often do we need to perform foot bath process for six to 12 month year old heifers? Months, old, yeah. So what I would say is, if you have an issue on those heifers, if you probably start them at, at six to 12 months old, probably once per week with the right baths, and ideally with heifers, you run them through, you run them back, you, you make a setup where you can run the heifers through, run them back to the same bath, so you, you get two 12 foot dosages of less than 2% formaldehyde or, or two and a half percent copper sulfate. But, and, and what I just wanna say with formaldehyde, formaldehyde is a great disinfectant if people are cautious for it, uh, about it, working with it, because it's a carcinogen and we need to make sure that when we mix it up or something like that, that it's either automated or we do, uh, we, use, we use respirators when, when we do, do the filling. It's a, it's a great disinfectant, and, and, and when it's all done, when it goes in the, in the manure lagoon, it, it's, it doesn't cause any, any heavy metal, uh, anything like that. So it's from that standpoint, but it's the, it's the people end of it, the, the person working with it, okay? Uh, we have five questions in the question and answer section. Do you have access to that? As yeah, well? I, I, I just I basically I answered them. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Uh, yep. Very okay. Uh, okay. I think. Yeah, I think I think I already answered most of them here. And you know, again, that vaccine that there is there's a lot of there was a lot of talk about it three four years. I haven't heard anything about it. And and what I want to sell, tell the people is, you know, if you every farm even because we know how to approach this heifer deal. If you treat the early active lesions, even the person that asked about uh, uh, the the heifer and the hoof baths. If I don't have, if I treat those early lesions, maybe, maybe it helps maybe once a week to run those heifers to hoof baths. And we know once they become pregnant, the, the incidence rates is not nearly as, as, as big as it is until they become pregnant. So the time they're, they're in heat until they become pregnant. It seems like if we can get to those three, four months until they're pregnant, we, 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 we're very, very uh, successful. So prevention of that is, is really better than any vaccine. You know, if we watch the early ones, uh, I've worked with farms in Switzerland in everywhere, and we started just looking at those breeding aged heifers. And eventually, after a couple, three years, we didn't have two-year-olds, we didn't have three-year-olds, because if they don't have it as, as heifers, the likelihood that digital dermatitis comes in in a milking herd, because we milking herds, we use a, a better managed hoof bath program. We have better hygiene, much less likely that the disease comes in in, 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 the, in, the, in the milking herd, okay? Do you have I think experience that with the claw sprayers and robots? What was that? Do you have experience with cl uh, claw sprayers in robots? Uh, I, I, I've been on some farms and I've never seen a lot of good results with them. You know, uh, one of the things I think is that the pressure sometimes is not enough. Uh, if the feet are dirty, we can spray a disinfectant on there, but it doesn't get there. So again, I think the important thing is now uh, there is a, a, a Swedish company, a Finnish company, uh, 4D Barn, that's designing some nice footpath setups for, 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 for robot facilities. And, and I think there again, too, those foot bath facilities, if they're incorporated in it right, farmers might only have to use them once or twice, once or twice a, a, a week, you know? Like on a large farm where we saw, we're using the hoof bath one day a week. 
and we really, uh, we, we treat very little active digital dermatitis. How do you define the targets? Is it the number of cows at any one time or is it the numbers per year? Uh, no, it's, 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 again, we go from the data. So if we're in that trim on a regular basis and all of a sudden, uh, what probably a lot of farmers, farmers have seen, especially known as hemisphere, in the fall time, we have those drying days. When we have those drying days, we come out of the summer where we use the sprinklers. The sprinklers actually keep the manure more wet, so the feet are not as sturdy, and the, the hoofs themselves. So there's less digital dermatitis always goes down, go down as soon as the sprinklers go on. And in the fall, when it dries up, digital dermatitis goes up because when it dries those nice drying days, the manure dries very quickly and then it cakes to the feet. So it creates the ideal environment that the bacteria actually like. So it, it cakes on and, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't dry. It dries on and then it gives the bacteria uh, 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 a problem underneath it. Uh, do, they have a place to invade. The, the skin is weakened. And there's one of the guys said, I have some experience with those systems. The cows are very smart and able to avoid the spray. See, uh, if something burns or something like that in a spray system like that, the cows actually will lift their feet. That's what we found with hoof baths without sidewalls. Cows would walk on the curb of the hoof baths or they walk outside of the hoof baths if they had a sore foot on, on, the, on the one side. So I, ask this, I think you may have answered it, but yeah. uh, which solution of foot bath do you advise for heifers or should we use foot baths for heifers regularly? I see foot rock sometimes. For me, I'm, I'm the type of guy is, if I don't have to use a hoof bath and I have things under control, I know multiple farms that, where we put a, a hoof bath in the heifer facility. And because we had a problem at the time, we got it under control. The hoof pass hasn't been used in years, because or in a couple of years, because if there's no problem, what's the purpose of using it in a heifers? I think in the milk cows it's different. You know, there we have to, you know, we have to make sure because we got foot rot as well. There, if we have a, a, a bacterial load or stress. There, it's it's probably more important to use a hoof bath. But I only use a hoof bath. Uh, for two reasons, to disinfect and in some places to clean. We could use a hyperchlorite solution uh, for cleaning feet or bleach. Bleach and soap is a great one if the feet are really dirty because it's just like we'd wash clothes or wash, wash uh, um, uh, dirty, dirty parts. If we soak them for a little while in, in a bleach and soap solution, that, that dirt is going to come off. And that's what we found was is on farms with a high, with really poor hygiene, where we didn't have a chance to spray, we would use uh, hyperchloride or bleach and soap in the hoof baths just to clean the feet. And then our disinfectant solution was so much more effective afterwards. So a lot of different, a lot of different ways to get there. But uh, you know, the thing we have to understand is, especially on larger farms, every time you use a hoof bath, that's 50 gallons of water. If we change that hoof bath every 200 cows, that's on 2,000 cows, that's, that's uh, 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 500 gallons of water a day. The more times we use it the way, that's, that ends up to be a lot of water. And water is, is, a, is a resource that we just shouldn't waste or we have to haul it back to the field again. So, so again, I like to do everything else and sure, I have farms where we use the hoof bath four times a week. And I have farms where we use it once a week, yeah, you know. So every farm is different depending on the infection rates, depending on how good a job we do with hygiene, all those type of things. Okay. So we have five more questions. Do oh, really? <laughs> you have a lot of questions. So do you think that heifers need uh, to hoof trim before 50 days of calving? Ah, uh, if they're, it, it, depending on the environment they're in, okay? What I like to do is with heifers, if we give them some outside excess, if they're on a bedded pack for 10 months while they're growing up and they never get onto solid ground, we're probably gonna have to do it earlier. But what I found was is on some of the farms that if we 
if we uh, give them some outside, like an outside lot access, just for, let's say, three days, a week for all four hours, four hours in those three days, out on a, on a dirt lot, even in the wintertime, out in the snow in the Northern Hemisphere. A lot of times that has solved the, 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 the hoof trimming issue in, in those heifers. Now, if the floors are really slippery in, in the heifer barn, if they never get out, it, it can happen that like generally a, a confirmed pregnant that we trim them. Uh, and then I would trim them again three to eight weeks before calving, making sure as soon as they, when they go in that close up pen, they have perfect claws. So again, depending on the environment, I like to do change the, the environment or the management so I don't have to trim heifers because it's never fun to trim heifers. And I don't, I don't do many of them, uh, hardly any, I don't do any today like where I did years ago. I, all my spring and heifers are trimmed, but we, we don't do in the heifer barns. We change the environments uh, for the heifers to, to make, make that happen. What about lamin? Laminitis or laminitis? Laminitis. Thank okay. You. Uh, yep. As a reason for laminitis. So, so when I talked about inflammation, basically, inflammation is is laminitis. It, it's it's the same thing. It's laminitis is kind of an all old term, and and in the past we've always associated laminitis with acidosis, although there is very little good data available that shows that, that acidosis causes uh, inflammation. It can, but there's not a lot of good data out there. So we found that a lot of the other things, the cow comfort, the standing time, the heat stress, all those things play, uh, are much easier to control than the other things. And, and with, with, with the ration, if we feed a consistent ration from hour to hour, day to day, week to week, there's rarely ever a problem with, with anything like that. So that's, so the, the results of inflammation will be the sole ulcer or the white line or in severe cases then the two ulcers. So how do you determine the best trimming schedule for a herd? It seems there isn't much evidence as to when they should trim and some recent Canadian studies showed that it may, maybe wasn't useful in older cows. Uh, I would probably, I would probably disagree, disagree with that. And, and I, I guess, I guess the thing here is again, if we have a little bit of data and see when those cows become lame, as an example, I've even seen it with grazing herds. If we trim those grazing cows while they're in the dry, while they're in the dry period, when they, when they come ready, it's like a race car. They're ready to go. They're ready to walk the tracks. They're ready to milk, produce milk. And there's a, a much smaller likelihood that they become lame. So, so for me, it, it's it's the environment and the management that dictate it. Uh, I think it's you know on, on some larger farms where there's a lot of wear. Sometimes I have cows I only trim once a year on, on one of the farms. But what we found as we they got in the fourth or fifth, sixth, seventh lactation. Uh, we'd see some lameness on those cows. So we started trimming those twice a year. And, and this farm has recycled sand, has a lot of wear. There's really not much to do except for step three. And, and once we do the heifers, we find like they're good till the end of the first lactation. But if we're on a rubber floor or if we do organic bedding, we don't have the wear that we have with recycled sand. And sometimes the, the disadvantage of recycled sand, that the recycled sand there's, it's too much. So we actually get too much wear and that's where the rubber comes in then. So, so we got cows with short claws with thin soles because they, they're walking too far on this abrasive recycled sand surface or they're walking too far on another uh, uh, surface. And, and we see the same thing on the larger grazing dairies. Larger grazing dairies have a huge problem with, with thin soles, especially when it comes to rainy season. Do you see a uh, successful foot health in cows with bedded lime blend or straw lime blend? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that the biggest thing I see there is with, with lime and straw is that the beds can kind of get hard if they're not managed well. 
and probably the only the only thing I would say is with the lime is sometimes if the lime is really really dusty it cakes a little bit more or it sticks to the back of the feet where the digital dermatitis lesions are and and it's really important in those cases that we control that we control the digital dermatitis well uh, and this as this particular this particular case because that that lime will almost put a seal on there and cause the bacteria to grow better underneath it. Last question: um, How many animals do you need to change the foot bath, or is it how many animals you need to change the foot bath, or yeah. including to copy? Yeah. Well, I, I see that I I see that question, and what I would say is, if we can keep the manure out of it, and if we have a pH product. You know, if that pH, uh, let's say, let's say we run 200 cows through it and there is no manure in, in, the, in the hoof bath. Maybe we can, the copper is still in there if we use copper. Maybe we can adjust that pH again to bring it from, from 4.8 down to 3.0 or 3.2. And maybe we can run another 150 or 200 cows through it. Because we know with copper, if the pH is between three and five, and there is not too much organic matter in the solution or very little, like we saw on both of those baths that I showed on the video. We're actually, that's actually what we're doing is we're spiking the hoof baths after a milking or after so many cows because there is no manure in the hoof bath. So, so you know, I would say 200 cows is a pretty good, but I have farms where we actually run 800, 900 cows through it before we change it. With, with systems like that. Just because we're able to keep the, the defecation, we're able to keep the, the feeder clean uh, and, and they don't drop manure in the hoof bath. So every farm will be different, okay? Excellent, I think that's the end of our questions. I'd just like to invite everybody to join us on the 23rd for Transitional Cow Facility Design with Courtney Halbach and she's with the Dairyland Initiative. So thank you very much, Carl. This was a really great presentation and uh, thank you to everybody who joined. It was, it was my great pleasure uh, to talk to everybody uh, from around the world and, and really some good questions here from, 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 from people out there. And, and it, it's important that, that we go to a no, no lameness tolerance, very important part. We can do it because so many farms are, are, are doing it. And thank you so much. Uh, to Artex for inviting me for this, and and I I'm sure I will see somebody somebody again someday. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.